Please welcome Milos Topic, Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Digital Officer at Grand Valley State University, Casey Falila Tolua, Senior Director, Channels and Self Service at Marriott International, and Brandon Milner, VP Product UX Design and Professional Services at Ellis Don. Welcome all. Great to have you with us on this Tuesday morning. Good morning. Great. Good Welcome. afternoon. Good morning. Yeah. Well, yeah. Good afternoon from me because I'm in the UK. <laughs> but good morning to a, a lot of you folks. Usually I'm on New York time. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to dive into this subject because culture is just, you know, it's important. It impacts everyone. Everyone's talking about it. You know, I shared a stat earlier um, from a BCG Global Innovation Study. You know, I shared that the biggest obstacles standing in the way of innovation are often related to company culture. How important is culture, you know, to you and your organization? And maybe give us a brief little introduction. You know, Casey, let's start with you first. Sure. I'm Casey Tolua. I am the Senior Director of IT Product Management for Marriott International. So my core responsibilities is for, it's CEC. So we call them customer engagement centers. Those are our global contact centers across the board. And my responsibility is over the voice IVR and the strategy for chatbot chat messaging for our frontline agents to support our customers. Fantastic, thanks Casey. Brandon, how about you? Tell us a little about yourself and uh, how important is culture to your organization? Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm Brandon Milner. Um, I'm VP of Products um, and uh, User Experience and Professional Services here at Ellis Don in Canada. Um, and, you know, it, within the construction industry, it's change is, is always slow. Um, however, it's, um, you know, where we, where we play is really around the data. And, and the previous speaker, you know, Lee, when he was talking about how data is so important. Um, I think that's a catalyst to to help change and help change the mindsets of, of guys on the construction sites and, you know, the buildings that we build. So it's very interrelated, um, but it is definitely a, a challenge for sure. Oh, yeah. So that that comment hit home too. great to hear it. You know, very Milos, sure. <laughs> let's come on over to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Milos Stolpic, Vice President for IT and Chief Digital Officer, responsible for uh, both leading the IT organization and re-enabling the future of higher education in our area. I work at Grand Valley State, about 23,000 students, 4,000 employees, multiple sites in Michigan. And before this, I was in New York and Jersey for 22 years. Um, I, my, I would start with a question back to you. You said 72% believe culture matters what mm -hmm. were the other 28 percent thinking yeah because the real question is what i'll call i mean and peter drucker was credited in saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast <laughs> if you don't have the right people and right sense of belonging and right unity everybody kind of not only being on the same boat but rowing in the same direction the possibility of your upside is always limited i think it's absolutely critical i think that everything starts with people Everything. Um, and leadership and what we tolerate in our organization as acceptable and as a norm. And I think everything else comes after that. So let's kick that off first because you brought up leadership. So this sparks a question. You know, what comes first then, leadership or culture? Milos, love for you to answer that first and then the rest of the panel dive in. It's chicken or the egg, right? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I think I pers I'm a student of leadership and I've been for a very long time. A lot of my degrees and research and things that I've done are in that field. Um, I think the leadership can absolutely influence culture, but there are certain tacit tenets of every organizational culture that are palatable that you feel that you sense when you come in and you join, but you can't necessarily put your finger on it. So it's like a massive ship takes a lot of time, a lot of space to turn around. I think leaders absolutely have a responsibility to influence the culture, model the behavior they want to see themselves. Uh, but I don't think that everything is entirely up to them. Mm. Great answer, Milos. Who wants to jump in here next? I see you, Brandon, you nodding your head. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I agree and I disagree with Milos. Um, I 110% agree with him that it comes from leadership. I think people have the propensity to change, um, but they need to, you know, they need to see leaders behaving culturally, professionally in the way that they 
would expect their employees and the rest of the organization to behave. Um, where I disagree with Milos is I think it really depends on the industry. And, you know, three years ago before I joined Elliston, I would have wouldn't have said the statement, but I've seen now that, you know, within the construction industry and previously in my experience in the retail industry and the loyalty industry, it really depends on the, the people on the ground. And, you know, spe spe specifically around like your middle management, I think that is key catalyst for change and innovation and driving that. Because if they're seeing and hearing the consistent messaging, like we do at Elliston from our CEO, Jeff Smith, who's always talking about data, 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 people will start to slowly engage that kind of uh, environment. Whereas before, you know, people were happy to use Excel and pieces of paper, and they still do in our industry globally, but it does come from top down. Um, but if you don't have a solid middle management that is actually engaging in your company values, you will never succeed because it's, it will just never work. Yeah, so I think we, we both said the same, just differently. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I, I did just, agree with you, Mila. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Maybe I can just balance it out and agree with both of you on, on multiple <laughs> points. Um, what I heard was modeling the behavior and doing it from the top down. I think there's an opportunity to have informed leadership. So if the leadership understands where is the culture that we want to take it forward with, I think that's one thing. But what I think is important is that leadership doesn't just model the behavior, but they enable and empower. So there is significant change that needs to take place throughout an organization. And I agree for those who are working in the trenches, they've been there for a while. They're very passionate. So how to take that passion and that skill and help them along that new transition into a new culture. I think it goes across the board both ways. Yeah, yeah we can't have great culture, that great leadership. And like you said, they need to enable and empower, you know, uh, I'm going to go back to Brandon's statement about Excel and spreadsheets because I started getting a headache when you talked about that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> how do you manage digital transformation in an industry that you know is very slow to adopt digital channels and new technologies? Anything you can share on that front? Yeah, I think you know managing digital transformation comes, I believe, with having a really deep understanding of of the different values specific to the nuances of the industry, which is what I was you know trying to allude to when when I agreed one hundred percent with Milos. Um, you know, what are the industry bottlenecks? What are the customers' biggest pain points? How do emerging technologies being used? And when it comes selfishly to the construction industry, it's not as simple as just engaging new te new technology companies. Uh, and launching new platforms or just blindly funding, you know, all these startups. Uh, we've seen a lot of success in some content, like construction tech startups, but most of them are around managing platforms, which ultimately means managing people's day-to-day uh, environments. Um, but that's not really the, the answer, I don't think, because the real disruption will require industry expertise and experience. Um, and at Ellis Don, I would say we've probably become quite the catalyst for innovation. You know, looking at areas where we build sustainable competitive advantages, consider the industries, people, segments, geographies, opportunities, and really look at the entire value chain. Um, and then also looking inwardly of like, you know, where can we change? What capabilities do we need? What technologies create opportunities? And it's important, to, I think, to remember that no industry is immune to disruption. Mm -hmm. um, so constantly evolving and changing. And, you know, as Casey and Milos and, and myself always saying that like top down leadership needs to like drink from the Kool-Aid so that middle management will 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 engage in these technologies is, I think, key to, to driving digital in, uh, innovation in an arguably very conservative and traditional uh, industry. Casey. Uh, I think that, uh, especially when I think about Marriott International, we have had customers who've been extremely loyal for decades upon decades. And so um, where you have an internal call contact center who knows that it's been successful in that human to human connection, uh, there's an opportunity for introducing this digital innovation and helping them understand Yes, it absolutely has been an extreme value and will continue to be, but it doesn't need to be using all of that time and energy of our frontline agents 
for every single topic that comes in, that there is opportunity for us to provide security and automation in the right areas. It takes some time to be able to do that and to help them along the way through um, step by step and being able to celebrate those wins and see them and feel them. But there is an opportunity. There definitely is an opportunity. You know, Milos, what, what does innovation mean to you? What can you share on this topic? It's progress. I think I think a lot of terms are misused and abused in recent years. When you hear digital transformation, it sounds so massive and huge and undertaking. And it almost comes with a stigma that implies that what we're doing now is wrong. It's broken. It doesn't work. Which causes a lot of people to rebel and push back against. It's about progress. It's about incremental advancement and growth. It's contextual. I think one of the things that Brandon said is spot on. It differs in every industry. To some small organization with seven employees moving their paperwork from decades of storage online and just digitizing them into PDFs that are not even, you know, ADA compliant or OCR readable is a massive transformational effort. Mm -hmm. And they're excited. So the rest of us. We're going to go, well, yeah, we did that like 27 years ago. We're not doing that. Mm -hmm. We're going to land a plane while flying it backwards. So I think it's very contextual. It's about progress. And it has to provide value to people using those products and services. I have often in my career seen people switching from a product or solution that has a blue interface to a purple one because someone likes it or someone mm -hmm. made that preference or made that executive decision. It provides no value. It compl complicates the lives of people. I believe that truly innovative products and modern digital solutions are like referees in a team sport. I, 20 years ago and a couple of healthier knees ago and probably 20 pounds ago, I used to play competitive sports. <laughs> and at the end of the game, if two team sports, soccer, basketball, football, pick a sport, when the game is over, if no one's talking about the referee, they've done a good job. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to find a way to ease the troubles in everyday lives of people, simplify the experiences and make things better and much easier than what they've done in the past. Yeah, love the sports analogy. And this kind of goes back to a little bit of what Lee was saying, you know, think about the value. Uh, look at digital capabilities and how they scale and, of course, the new business models. So, uh, you know, kind of really relating back to that conversation. We have our first audience member who wants to come up on stage and ask a question. So let's pull her out of the audience grid uh, that we had up. Uh, Blanca from Televisa Univision, welcome to the stage. What is your question or comment for the panel? Hi, good morning. I've heard a lot. Um, we have a lot of, there's been a lot of buzz about des designing culture. And every time we try to discuss it and every time we try to sort of bring it into the fold of the company and sort of build, try to try to bring in more engagement, try to bring in uh, more associates to get involved, it never quite, never quite ramps up. And I just wanted to, you know, it doesn't seem like, I mean, if we could really design culture, I mean, I think all our world problems would be solved if we could design <laughs> culture. Um, so I just wanted to hear your take on it because I just don't think, um, I don't think it's working. I don't, I think if we're going to design a culture, I think we all need to buy into the design and we're not really um, having that discussion about what, you know, even when we talk about values, even our va even the communication or the facilitation of that conversation doesn't seem to go well. Uh, I can jump so in. Design, design <laughs> culture, your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think you, you can't design culture. I think you can nurture culture. I think you can try your best. Um, and you know, I don't know if Milos has hacked into my computer or not, but we're actually going through a massive change of paper base to digital, uh, OCR, putting up all you can imagine years and years of, of paper based solutions. And now we have to digitize it. You know, when, when I put that forward to the execs originally, they were like, but I thought we were doing digital transformation here. And I'm like, but if you speak to the people with that are on the ground, that are literally like, in Canada, you know, minus 30 degrees building buildings, they don't care about an app that can track their movements and, you know, through AI machine learning can do blah, blah, blah. They just want their lives to be easier and they don't want to do paper. They don't want to be paper pushers anymore. So I think, um, you know, to answer your question is how do you instill culture? I think it's, it's, it's a slow build. I don't think it's it's a mandate of obviously their values and goals and missions of the company, but I think you have to 
start off small and it's it's a it's a I want to say a slow slog but you know to Casey and Melissa's point is there's no magic bullet it's really understanding your people understanding your customer base in in the case of Melissa and Casey but for us it's really around understanding our people's needs and listening to them because if you don't listen and you dictate you will end up you'll get what you want but you'll have a very disruptive workforce and not a happy company so even the stupid things like paper like digitizing paper for us it's it's a, a benign exercise but for the people that really matter it's important to them so it's important to listen i i would i would just briefly just briefly add that um i agree with brandon you cannot design culture design has finite constructs and expectations all the magic happens when you color outside the lines yeah. it's a gray space you can influence it you can model behavior you can very clearly demonstrate the values and what you accept and tolerate and what you do not but designing culture is not a thing that i've ever seen um the, be done successfully and being in doing this for 25 years the thing i would add for um the industry that i'm in is if everyone is focused on the customer experience with the customer first, how do they bring value to that? So it's it's having that centralized focus. So whether it's a frontline agent who's answering the call and they're trying to understand why is AHT so important, um, being able to bring that value, how does it tie back up to the ultimate goal across the board? Once we can ever get everyone focused on what are the values of the company? What is it that we wanna drive for? then we can start to pull that culture together to say, does everything that I do add purpose to that ultimate value? And then being able to pull in the digital technology for each of those levels to say, this can help enable you, this can help get you there faster, better, smarter, then it starts to bring in. But I absolutely agree with both Milos and Brandon. We can't, we can't design it, but we can certainly help teach along the way and empower and help them feel the impacts that they're making with the collaboration partnership with technology. Yeah, I think that sums it up nicely. Blanca, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. And to Brandon's point, we actually, um, about five years ago, we implemented Kronos time in attendance. We had, we were collecting 3000 manual time sheets and people, our associates that were the, at time, our hourly employees, did, they just didn't want, they liked the paper, yeah. they liked the paper, they liked walking it over. Mm -hmm. And I literally had to do um, a tour. Like I did a, a tour, I, I went to every single location. I ended up having to even um, create people's Apple accounts on their phone and show them how to use their cell phone so that they can download the app and enter their time. And five years later, nobody wants paper. And every time I think Kronos went down a couple of months ago and everyone was like, what paper? I think it takes really, it takes that face to face and that what's in it for you conversation. Mm -hmm. It can't just be something that's mandated and think that people will just do it. I think you really have to have your boots on the ground and champion it and really have those conversations to show people what's in it for them. And it's been a great success ever since. I mean, 3000 manual time sheets weekly and bi-weekly all gone, like that work and that the, the effort that was put into that, all automated, 13 unions automated, everything, you know, all the calculations, that's the best, uh, that's the, the, the best culture improvement that there was just in that little bit of innovation. Yeah, thank you so much, Blanca, and I appreciate you coming up on stage and asking a question. Uh, we'll say goodbye to you now, but we do have another audience member that wants to come on up and share a question or a comment. So we will welcome uh, Sarab from Sitco. Welcome, Sarab. Great to have you on this Tuesday morning. What's your question or comment for the panel here? Hey, good morning, all. Uh, very, very informative discussion. Thanks to the panel members on this one. Uh, I have a different take in terms of the culture change. What I see is culture change has to be disruptive because you cannot nudge people to go to one side unless there is a stick and carrot method to force people uh, take a, a specific stand or change the way of doing the work. You cannot just change it because people tend to then go back to their old way of working. Like what Casey mentioned about the the uh, the timesheet system, right? <laughs> the moment your solution goes live, you need to force people 
to use that. You need to tell them that no longer the timesheet on paper would be acceptable. That needs a sudden change and that mandate has to come from the top. Mm. How would you be changing the culture by creating it as, as, a, as a democratic process? It has to be, I would say, a dictatorship kind of thing or a, a mandate which comes from top. I, I was referring in, in my comment, you see the recent changes in, say, one of the social media apps, which we all know, there is a leadership change on top. And the way now they have they have been working for the last couple of weeks, it, it's a complete culture change you would observe within, I would say, days, not even weeks or months. So how would you then comment in terms of the culture change if you are trying to nudge people and then start going slowly to a, a innovative mind frame? Who wants to jump in here, Milos? I see you going like this. <laughs> I am. I, I I appreciate the courage and the position, but I am. I, to a degree, conceptually, I understand what you're saying. In practice, I absolutely disagree with you, and here's why. There are certain things you can mandate, and again, it depends on the industries. I'm in higher education. I have 1,800 faculty. Thousand of them are tenured. If we were to mandate everything and say this is effective Monday, would you like it or not? There's pitchforks coming up <laughs> standing in front of my office. So that's not changing culture. That's just influencing behavior. And there's a huge difference between influencing behavior and changing culture. There is no organization of any size or scope that can change culture in days, period. Second, if there's a really good book by Simon Sinek, Start With Why. If you read that book, it talks about intrinsic motivation being so much more powerful than carrots and sticks. If you want, I'm not saying nudge everybody along, not saying let's mandate and design by a committee because that doesn't work either. But to change the culture, it takes a longer time. People want to be in it because of what they believe in, what they stand for, and that something has to be bigger than themselves. Not because the boss says do this or else you're fired. That's not leadership. That's bullying. That's putting people in the corner and exercising your authority, not your leadership abilities. And I think it depends on a lot of context as to how do you execute that as you move forward. If I could just add another plug for Simon Sinek, um, one of the opportunities is the infinite game. And so that kind of behavior of I'm going to force this decision in a very short amount of time, you may get the results that you're looking for for the short term, right? Like you will get those results, but from a culture perspective, if we're striving for that infinite game, maybe we have to take baby steps at the beginning, go a little bit slower, but look at what is that legacy, even beyond our own current roles. You know, how does the organization stand up long after we're gone? And I think that what I appreciate now is it used to be that anybody who would like to make a pitch, they'd come in and do a sales pitch and say, these are all the great things we can offer you. And then you just kind of have to decide, do you want to take it? Now, the dialogue is much broader to say, I'm going to give you a pitch, but feel free to talk to some of my customers. And listen to what they say, how does it impact? And if the same goes internally, I make sure that when we roll out something new that we're asking and calibrating across the board, what are the pain points that each of our employees are feeling today? And then when we offer these solutions, we're like, we've heard your voice. We'd like to propose these are the solutions that could address those, give us your ideas so that by the time we've implemented it, we do have that adoption across the board. And it may still be able to happen in a short amount of time, hmm. but they felt involved, they felt heard, and then they are able to tie the solutions of this technology that we're introducing to how that solution is rolling out. And they understand like that loop back around. This is what we told you it would look like. Is that what it is once we've actually implemented it and they're able to give that ongoing feedback? Thank you so much, Casey. And hey, look, there's no one size fits all. It works for one company, it may not work for the other, but we appreciate, Sarab, you coming on up here, sharing some insight. It's sparking a little friendly debate here on the panel. So thank you so much, Sarab. We're going to bring up another audience member. Uh, Fayaz from A-Team wants to join the panel. So let's bring them on up and see what question they have for you. Hello, welcome. Hi. Um, quick question going back to company culture and hiring. Um, with the new way of working, remote teams, remote individuals, how, how has that shifted the way you leaders think about um, hiring um, and working with these blended teams? Or is this something, is this a strategy that's coming up and that you're working on or something that you're doing in practice right now? 
Fantastic question. Brandon, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, that's a, that's a very <laughs> interesting question, specifically around um, um, you know, retail industry or construction industry where you need boots on the ground or proverbial boots on the ground. Um, you know, we we actually had a very in Canada there was there was a couple of very stringent lockdowns during during the pandemic, um, but we still needed to build buildings. So, you know, the way we got a the way we navigated that 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 whole situation was really around our health and safety um, departments. <clears throat> so, obviously, health and safety is a primary concern on any construction site. Um, but when it comes to things like COVID, social distancing, things like that, it's very difficult to build a building when you have to remain six feet apart. Mm. So, you know, implementing protocols and structures around that was never a barrier to hiring people. So people just understood that if they're in this industry and there are construction sites, th that there will, there will be an element of, of disruption for sure. But when it came to sort of our corporate and our head office, and particularly around my group and our building digital group, which is the, our like, technology group here at Elliston, we had to we had to take a uh, you know we try to take a hard stance of like no you've got to come into the office we're professionals blah blah blah, but at the end of the day people just did not feel comfortable like from a mental health perspective from a everybody has families that everybody has their own situations that they don't want to compromise themselves with. And we actually, you know, to Casey's point, we listened to, to our employees and we knew that it wasn't a case of, well, we, if we force them to come into the office, they're going to leave. It, we weren't worried about attrition. It was actually about, in a way, the, the pandemic drove a cultural shift and change to the point where people actually felt engaged to come into the office. So by hiring... We never overtly said, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that are, we're a hybrid, you can work from home or, or not. We give people the choice. We don't explicitly say things, but we really let people, because everybody has their own story and their own personal decisions on, on how, and their feelings, and a lot of them are private. So you can't, you can't dictate something like that, unless you're in a, you know, frontline service industry where you have to. But in the technology industry, I feel, you know, there is a large portion of people that want to just stay at home forever, but there's also people that want to engage. So, you know, we, we had to make a lot of changes at our head office from a structural perspective. And I mean, physically, like moving the office around because we didn't need so much space anymore. So we turned it into more collaborative places where people would feel more comfortable to come in and maybe once or twice a week to, to, to work together. But I don't think... I may be wrong, but I don't see a day where we're now suddenly mandating people to come in. And I think that will drive a hiring um, policy around Elliston, where it mm. becomes, it's your choice. Obviously, there's some positions you have to be in the office or on site, but really it becomes a listen to people, listen to what they're saying, don't dictate. And if you can facilitate that, if you're fortunate enough to facilitate that kind of engagement, then I think you won't have problem hiring people. And it'll be less about the money and more about the choices and the environment that you create for people. And I know that sounds very cheesy, <laughs> but we've seen it in practice that like okay. people will come to us for the same amount of money that they paid at other companies because of the environment, because we allow them to have a choice. Um, and obviously, it's not a complete democracy, but we, we try our best. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. You know, uh, I know we have a little bit more than 10 minutes left in the session, but Casey, what can you share from, you know, Marriott and your experience? I agree with Brandon. It's really about the engagement. It's helping our associates, who we call agents, understand that the value that they bring for that human connection to our customers is not inhibited by the distance of whether they're in the office or they're working remotely and just making sure to hone in on that. There are a lot of solution providers out there as well that offer gamification and help people pe keep people engaged. Like, you know, are there games? Are there competitions? Are there visibility to, I am not just sitting in my home working remotely and completely alone. I am just as engaged as before. Uh, some folks prefer more of the hybrid approach, but um, I think for me, just 
recognizing that the skill set for phones versus chat and messaging are very different and being able to respect that you have to match the right skill set to the right technology in order for them to continue to feel engaged and to continue to feel like they're truly bringing the value that the company is asking for. Yeah. So hopefully that helps, Fayaz, but thanks for jumping up on stage and ask this question. Enjoy the rest of the summit. I'm sure we'll see you guys in a little bit. All right, we have one more audience question we're gonna bring up. Nick from Graham Construction wants to join us on stage. Let's bring up Nick and say good morning. Nick, what's your question or comment for the group? Oop, I don't know if I hear you. There you go. Now we, oh, maybe. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that the common phrase? I think, you're on mute. <laughs> I think you're on mute, famous last words. Go for it, Nick. Really well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, GDS and, of course, the panel, and uh, it's been a great discussion. Um, it's interesting around uh, culture and, and, you know, we talk about various aspects of it. Um, and, Brandon, I completely agree with you um, with respect to, you know, choice and, and offering that choice. And that's one thing that we've done is, uh, is offering that choice. And, and certainly it has, driven, it has driven a change in our culture. One of the things that uh, was really interesting for us uh, around digital transformation as well as uh, culture is uh, the changing demographic uh, that, uh, that is out there from a hiring pool. And as we're getting more and more uh, of that uh, younger demographic, we're finding that more and more individuals out there are looking for the capability of actually being able to do something in their hand versus uh, paper or having to go to a computer or, or having that mobile. And I think that's really driving a, a big culture change. And I think the other thing is, and, and maybe you guys can speak to this as well, is, you know, how are you approaching um, culture change or how are you how are you managing that shift in culture? So I think uh, culture has to be fluid just as much as uh, being just saying, this is our culture and this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do things for the rest of, you know, the rest of time. How do you manage that shift in culture and, and what have you seen over the last couple of years uh, specifically around that culture shift? Excellent question. Milos, let's throw that one to you first. Sure. Uh, I think your your last sentence says said it all. It has to be fluid. There's no, I, I struggle when people say this is our culture. I don't know what that means, right? When people say, oh, you yeah, can do ROI by everything. Great. What's the ROI of your mother? Quantify it for me. What's the number, right? <laughs> or your dad or your sister, or your sibling or your grandparents. So, um, Culture, you can demonstrate your values. The culture has to be fluid and to kind of second what everybody else is saying, what we're going through right now is our flexible work arrangements process. And we're making decisions based on the roles and functions they perform. So if you are a developer sitting behind four screens, I really don't care if you're sitting in Madagascar. Good for you. Have a wonderful day. I can check your code. I know where it goes. I see if you're being productive or not. Uh, if you're staffing uh, an area where people walk in, we have thousands of students or faculty or staff walk into a physical space, some of our innovation centers and some other places, somebody has to be there to greet them, to help them, to move things along. Now, if this team is a team of 20, not all 20 need to be there Monday through Friday. Maybe three or four can come in on Mondays and Thursdays and different three and four and Tuesdays and Thursdays and so forth. So you create flexibility you are really focused on understanding of what they need and you just have some kind of whether it's quarterly or semi-annually or an annual review to make sure it still makes sense and the only provision that i would always advise because i think in life pendulum swings and pendulum has swung very far in the last two and a half years i think it's starting to drop back a bit i always make decisions when we put them in there's always a last disclaimer um these policies and changes could be reversed for a number of reasons. And one of them that I put in is change in leadership. If why I one day move on to something else, I do not want to handcuff those coming after me. If they come back five or seven or nine years after me and they want to do things differently, they should have that freedom to do so. Who wants to come on in next? Maybe you, Brandon. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I do agree that, that one shoe doesn't fit all. So, you know, Graham, uh, sorry, I'm saying Graham because you, you have the sign up there. But, um, you know, in, in our industry, we do have a hybrid uh, workforce where we have, you know, it's not 10, 10 people greeting people, but it's like two, three, four, five hundred guys and, and girls on a site. 
Um, and you can't be you can't be too rigid. You have to you have to be fluid. I agree with Milos. Like you you've got to be prepared to adapt and prepared to just be accepting the fact that it's it's just the way of the world at the moment. Things will eventually change. Um, you know, I could never imagine a, a, a life where I was only coming into, I come into the office on Tuesdays and Thursdays and I love it. Like I have Monday, Wednesday, Friday where I work from home and I actually come into the office because I, I love that social aspect of it and you, you, you'll never substitute that on Zoom. However, um, there's productivity and then there's, there's a certain amount that's said about productivity of people standing around the cooler or around the coffee machine. And sometimes those are where the best conversations are had. And I think we all know that, but it is a struggle because you get used to after two years of just getting into your comfort zone, suddenly now you have to get out of your comfort zone and you, you, you've got to be forced to change. So our, you know, the, the approach that Milos takes where he puts the disclaimer on and, you know, <laughs> substance, substance to leadership change. I wish every company would do that because it does give you the option of, you know, I always think like what happens when eventually I leave, you know, and I've instituted all these policies and they're so ingrained within the workforce. It's not fair to the next leader of like, well, what happens if I like to do things differently? So it's it's a yes, no answer, really. It's, it's, there's, there's a lot of fluidity there. And I, like I say, every company is different, every industry is different. And you have to just, as Casey said, listen to your customers, listen to your workforce and hear what, they, what they're saying and action on that. And by that, you will create a culture, not by saying this is our policy on a piece of paper. Yeah, you know, Casey, you shared some, some great advice before anything else you wanna leave us off with. I know we only have a couple minutes left. No, I think that was very well covered. Perfect. Well, hopefully, Nick, that answered your question. Again, thanks for joining us. Come on up anytime. Um, and, you know, panel, before we do wrap things up, you know, what's the biggest key takeaway you want to leave with our audience members before you guys, uh, you know, get off the main stage when it comes to innovation and culture? So uh, let's go to you first, Casey. Okay, the pressure. Uh, I would say... <laughs> Bold, be courageous, mm, ask the that. questions. I, I know, you know, my organization, we love to do teardowns. It is no longer about looking at an end-to-end -end process or the end-to-end -end customer journey and saying, let's hone in on two steps and figure out what we can do to streamline that. It is really asking the question like, why did we do this in the first place? Not just fixing little things, but just re-asking the questions and, and not putting limitations on what do we think we can do? Really just opening up our minds, that energy, that courage, and being bold enough to say, why not? Let's take a look at it and let's learn. Be bold. Love that, Casey. Milos, how about you? Top takeaway. Sure. Uh, three very brief points. One, as a leader, I have to be accessible and you have to communicate. People need to understand why we're doing what we're doing. Two, I know it's popular. It's not always popular to say, especially for companies that are publicly traded, but it's not about your customers. It's about your people first. You take care of your people. They will take care of your customers. And that's a challenge. And then three, and I think the most important one, things that we always ask ourselves on our team is, if anyone anywhere has ever accomplished this, why can't we? Mm. And if no one has ever done it, why can't we be the first ones? Have some courage. Go out there and try something new. Oh, perfect. I feel that like, really like I want to punch through a wall Brand now. Yeah, Brandon, <laughs> uh, good luck with yours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks both of you for setting me up for failure. But I think, I think honestly, there, there are two, there are three, but you know, the two big things for me are a high degree of empathy, um, a high degree of sympathy, um, and really the final thing for me is really you lead. I know the most cliched thing and meme on the internet is lead by example. And I really believe that, that if you don't listen, you don't act in the way that you expect people to, around you to behave or act. And I do the same with my family. You're not going to get that empathy, that sympathy or that support and that change. So I would say that's that would be my takeaways. Hey, you guys, all perfect. Be bold. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to try something new. And of course, lead with empathy and lead by example. Hey, this has been a great discussion. And I want to thank all our audience members for coming up on stage, joining you guys. Uh, thank you for being candid, open, and honest. And of course, some friendly debate. Enjoy the rest of the summit, guys. And we hope to see you again soon.
Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.